Hi there, Donovan. I watch your channel when I can, and I'm really glad I'm finally able to contribute. I've been an avid hiker and an outdoor enthusiast for a long time. I've always wondered if I'd come across anything odd or supernatural. I think I finally have, and I'm wondering what my next step should be. I'm on a countrywide road trip in my decked out van. I started my journey in California, and I'm ending here in Maine. After this week, I'm going to sell my van to a guy over here on the East Coast and catch a flight to New Zealand. I'm able to finance my travels by exchanging farm help for accommodation. Organic farms are usually short-staffed, and they always need all the extra help they can get. So I volunteer with them in exchange for food and a shower and maybe a little extra cash. I've done it all, from picking avocados to shearing sheep to swimming in a cranberry bog. It's a tough lifestyle, but I wouldn't have it any other way. I'm able to travel all around the world, and I get to meet a ton of cool and interesting people. I've been in Vermont for about three weeks now, and I was just getting ready to pack up. My host now is just as cool as the rest. He owns a maple syrup production business and grows sugar maples all on his property. It's in the middle of nowhere, and it's about 30 acres, so it's pretty easy to get lost in. The farm is a relatively small operation, but there are few part-time workers that lend a hand, even on other crops like the pumpkin patch and herb garden. There's no cell service, but there's a landline and a home computer inside that he lets me use. That's where I am now, as I'm writing to you. Maple syrup production is mainly done in the winter and early spring, so my host hires more farmhands in the beginning of the year. It's fall now, so there's not a ton to do, no bottling or boiling the sap, but there's a lot of basic farm tasks that need to be done. We've been trying to set up some new tap lines and have been rebuilding the sugar shack. I've also been tasked with chopping down some of the dead trees on the property and making them in the firewood. On this particular day, I was tasked with hauling some cut logs back to the sugar shack. The farm has a really sweet pickup truck that they use to go around the property, so the job was kind of a piece of cake. I really only brought out my axe. Again, there's no cell service out there, so I left my phone in the house. I really wish I brought it, so I could take a picture and show you what I saw. You'll just have to take my word for it though, unfortunately. I was only like five minutes into the woods when I started to hear this weird noise. It was like a static hum or a buzzing noise. I thought my ears were just ringing at first from going hunting earlier that week, but it kept on going and I could tell it just wasn't in my head. I thought maybe it was a plane going by or a strange cricket, but the sound was just too different than anything I've ever heard before. I kept working on the logs and hauling some pieces onto the truck when curiosity got the best of me. I'll be honest, I didn't really want to investigate because my host's wife was making pot pies for dinner and I wanted to get my work done on time, but I just couldn't help myself. It was almost like I was drawn to it or something. I kept walking towards the noise. Luckily, the trees are marked and numbered, so I knew I'd be able to find my way back. The sound kept buzzing louder and louder, almost vibrating in my ears, until I eventually found myself in a clearing. Straight ahead of me was this whitish, bluish light glowing in the middle of the clearing, about three feet off of the ground. I could see through it, but there was like some electricity or energy pulsing in it. It was just about three feet tall too, and it was shaped like an oval. Around the light were these waves of movement, like heat coming off of the pavement. I was just stuck there staring at it for a minute when I finally snapped out of it. Like any idiot would, I decided to chuck a stick at it. The stick hit the thing and its shape glowed bright white. Then it was gone, but I didn't see the stick hit the ground. It was like it was sucked into it. I decided that was the moment for me to get out of there, so I quickly made my way back to the truck. When I parked back to the house, I told my host and his wife, but neither of them believed me. I convinced them to go with me and check it out, but by the time we got there, it was gone. In the place where it was, however, was a scorch mark. The grass was burnt, like something was lit on fire or poked with a torch. I know this sounds nuts, but I'm telling you the truth. I'm just glad I didn't drive or walk into it by accident. I'm heading out to Maine this week, but I told my host to keep an eye out for anything weird like that. 
I don't know what this was. Was it a portal or some type of energy field? I have no idea. Hey Donovan, I'm a fan and a frequent listener of your show. I especially like when the stories are about unexplained occurrences and creatures in the woods. I think if anyone spends enough time in the outdoors, they'll eventually come across some strange things, things that they can't explain. Whenever I sat around a campfire with my uncle as a kid, they'd tell me scary stories about things they saw in the forest. Well now I have a story of my own to share. Almost everyone in my family owns property on the outskirts of the Finger Lakes National Forest. My backyard juts up against it. The forest sits on a ridge called the Backbone, between Lake Seneca and Lake Cayuga. My family has been hunting and trapping the area for five or six generations. We joke that the forest is our ancestral lands, because we've been here for so long. In the early spring, I hike up to the peak of the Backbone and set beaver traps along the stream that flowed down into the lakes. My family used to make most of its money on beaver pelts at the turn of the century. Now it's just a hobby for us that has been passed down for generations. I'm actually an accountant by day. I'm sure my great-great-grandparents are horrified. I check my traps early every morning before I head into work. On days that I work from home, I'll sometimes check them again before sunset. Last season, I was walking my trap line before work when I saw some disturbing things. The traps that were triggered all had mostly eaten beaver carcasses in them. Blood, bone, and shredded beaver meat littered the rocks and weeds around the traps. It looked like someone shoved their bodies through a wood chipper. It was a grisly scene, but nothing so far from the ordinary that I should be spooked. Predators getting into your trap line is a regular problem. What did startle me about the situation was the scent left behind and the damage done to the traps themselves. My traps are heat treated steel, built for heavy use, but they still had massive gashes and dents in them. No animal, not even a bear, has enough power in its jaws to crumple steel like that. The traps had an oily coating on them that smelled like this rancid meat. At first I thought it was the beaver carcasses but the kills were too fresh to smell already. Whatever creature had ransacked my line left behind a distinct smell of musty, rotten meat. I talked to my uncles about the incident, and one of them reported a similar situation. Ransacked traps and the smell of rancid meat. His trap line was not far from mine, so it was an easy jump to assume the same animal that destroyed my trap line did the same thing to his. This happened twice more, as we began to joke that a zombie bear was roaming the hills. We laughed about it, but I was starting to get spooked and I could tell my uncles were too. We decided we need to figure out what was going on, so we bought a bunch of trail cams and placed them around our traps. They were simple motion activated cameras that would snap a picture if anything moved inside their field of vision. For a few weeks we didn't see anything. It wasn't even beaver season anymore, but we kept throwing out traps anyway. I'm not advocating poaching, but we really wanted to find out what this thing was. Finally, one of our cameras caught something. I knew we had something before I even looked at the camera when I saw the ransacked trap. The familiar smell of rotting meat was present, and I found patches of hairy skin hanging from low branches and bushes. It looked like the creature's skin was molting off, like in those nature documentaries when the snakes shed out of their skin. I took the SD card out of the camera and nearly ran the whole way back to my car and sped home to see what was on it. The pictures weren't the best quality, but you could clearly make out a dog wolf-like head with these eyes glowing in the moonlight. But there was something wrong with the way it was built. It wasn't just that it was way too big to be a dog or a coyote. It had a huge hump on its back and it was very broad like human-like shoulders. The camera was black and white so I couldn't tell what color the creature was. But the picture was clear enough to see that the thick fur around its head and neck thinned out around the body to show light colored, maybe gray skin underneath. There isn't much else I could tell from the first picture, but a succession of photos taken as the creature moved showed that it could even stand on its hind legs. I thought we had solid proof of a wolf-human hybrid. I sent the pictures to the Fish and Game Commission 
and the National Forestry Service, and some local news outlets. Nobody took it seriously. The local news was the only one to run the story, but they treated it as more of a joke. I'm not even angry about it, honestly. I'd assume it was just photoshopped or something if I saw the pictures. A park ranger I knew took a look at the pictures and checked out the site of the traps with me, but he said it was probably a black bear with a bad skin infection, like mange that was making it look and smell like that. But I've since become an expert on bear anatomy after obsessively trying to figure it out and no bear is built like that creatures I have pictures of. The legs and the shoulders are too human-like. I used to hike and camp a lot in those woods. I still hunt and trap, but I always carry a rifle on me now. I never spend the night in the trees. I have a story to share with you that has been bothering me for almost five years now. I live in the rural town of Inwood, Iowa, where everyone knows everyone and loves to gossip. So for obvious reasons, I'd rather not give out my name. I hope that's okay. I turned 16 in the summer of 2017 and got my driver's license. Anyone who's ever been to Inwood would tell you there's not a whole hell of a lot to do there or really anywhere to go. But having my driver's license at the very least meant that I could get out of the house and off of the farm once in a while. Usually the day would wind up with me picking a bunch of my friends up and we just cruise up and down the dirt roads until the gas light came on, or one of us got a call from our parents to head home. Life in Inwood isn't all that exciting, but it's pretty safe. That's how I wound up in the situation I found myself in the first place. I was driving around that morning just like any other, waiting for my friends to answer their phones, so I could start gathering them up. It was getting near the 4th of July, so the fireworks stands were in full swing, and I thought it would be fun to buy a few and blow some up down by the lake. Unfortunately though, my friends weren't as enthusiastic and seemed to be sleeping in late, ignoring me and my texts altogether. I didn't want to be at home, though dad was working on a new irrigation system for the farm, and I knew if I showed my face he'd want me to help. So I got my car and I went for a drive on my own. I decided to head down some country roads I'd never explored before and see what I could find. I knew the little town of Inwood well, but there were all kinds of farms and interesting landmarks. I figured I might as well use my time looking for them. It didn't take me long to run across something I'd never expected. As I came over a steep hill south of town, I laid my eyes on the most beautiful farmscape I'd ever seen. It wasn't a modern farm by any means. There were no signs of tractors or machinery of any kind. It looked exactly like the kind of farmscape you'd see in some turn of the century painting. At the top of the hill sat a huge white house with a wraparound porch. Off to the east side of the house was a giant red barn, and the yard was peppered with chickens out clucking and scratching the ground, and there was a tidy little lush garden laid out in the front lawn. I didn't even notice the old woman standing in the yard until I got right up to the place, and by then it was too late to stop or turn around. It turned out the house was on a dead-end road, and the only hope I had of driving away from it was to come to a stop in the old lady's driveway and turn around. As I came to a stop, she came right up alongside the car and tapped on my window. It would have been impolite not to roll down the window and talk to her. This is a beautiful car, she said to me, as if she knew who I was. In truth, the car wasn't anything special. It was an old hand-me-down Toyota my parents had given to me with rust along the bumper. I thanked her and started to apologize for driving down her road, explaining that I was just out for a cruise. None of that mattered to her. She seemed thrilled to have me there and insisted that I come inside. Inwood being the polite and safe town that it is, I didn't think twice about it. After all, what else did I have to do that day? Inside the house, everything was immaculately clean, but also old fashioned. She cut me a slice of fresh baked bread and we sat down at her kitchen table and we talked for a few hours. She had so many interesting stories, but more so she seemed interested in everything that I had to say. She asked me so many questions about my life and school and friends and my father's farming that I wound up losing track of time. I told her I had to leave and she asked me if I'd do her one favor 
and fetch her a pail of water from outside the well before I left. I asked her if she had running water and she laughed, telling me that she could never afford to have such pipes run. I thought that strange, but I did as she asked and I got her the water. I felt sad leaving her like I knew she would be lonely once I was gone, so I told her I'd come back the next day and bring my mom. My mom was a friendly lady who loved to help others out. Maybe she even know a way to get the old woman some water lines. True to my word, I went home that night and told my mom about the old woman I'd met. She was furious with me for being gone all day, but once I told her where I had been, she was eager to meet the lady and see if she could befriend her or offer any help. When we drove out the next day though, I couldn't explain what we found. The barn was fallen in on itself. The red paint had long worn off through years of hard weather. The beautiful lush garden was overgrown with ragweed and thistle. The fence posts were rotted and falling over. There wasn't an animal on sight. The house too was run down with pieces of the roof long gone and the windows all busted out. The front door was left wide open. We walked in, careful of the rotted floorboards, and there it was. Right in the middle of the kitchen floor was that pail of water I'd hauled in the day before. Of course, there was no sign of the old woman either. I've driven by that house probably a hundred times since, and I've never found the scene that I happened on that first day. There's just no explaining what I saw. Hey Donovan, hope you're doing well. You're probably doing better than I am. I was just fired from my job because of something I saw. For several years I've been working for this company that creates VR and 3D interactive photos for the purposes of construction and selling real estate, logistics and creating virtual tours for companies. My latest assignment was to do a 3D scan of one floor of an old office building. The client was trying to rent it out. I have to say right off the bat, this place gave me the creeps. I was ready to take the photos and 3D scans of this place and get out of there as quickly as possible. When I took the first scan, I couldn't capture anything in the room because of what appeared like a thick white fog that covered the entire room. I didn't see any fog in there with my eyes, so I figured it had to be smudges on the lenses of the 3D camera. I cleaned the lenses and tried to capture the room again. When I looked at the footage scanned, all that showed up was what looked like a dense fog that filled the room again. I was pretty frustrated, and I believed it was a technical malfunction of either the camera or our software that was causing me to waste my time in this run-down, creepy building. I moved on to a room on the other side of the building, thinking maybe it was some sort of electromagnetic interference. After doing another scan, I got the same result, and I figured I would try again later with different equipment. I took the 3D camera and my computer back to my work and had this guy Eric from the IT department look at the files of the scans. He told me that he had never seen anything like this happen before and it must have been a glitch with the software on my computer. He gave me another camera and computer and I headed back to the old building. As soon as I got back there, I felt uneasy, but I was just ready to complete this job and never come back to that place again. I set up my equipment and took a scan of the main room. When I looked at the footage, it had successfully scanned the entire room, but it looked like there was this red filter on all the footage. It reminded me of those old 007 movies, where James Bond shoots the screen and blood drips down over the camera lens. I tried several more times. All of the footage was still red. I called my boss and explained all the technical malfunctions I was having. He told me to take the equipment to IT and just try again tomorrow. The next day I went up to IT and Eric told me that all of the equipment was working perfectly now. Relieved, I made my way back to this building and was ready to get this job behind me. I set everything up and began the scan. I left the room so I wouldn't be in the footage, and after a few moments I went back in. I checked the footage and this time on the computer screen, it said there was an error capturing the scan. I tried again and when I came back in, my computer said the same thing. I called IT and they told me to restart the computer, unplug the camera, and plug it back in. I did as they instructed and then I couldn't get my computer to register the camera as being plugged in. IT told me to bring the equipment to them and they would give me new equipment that they were sure worked perfectly. 
This entire process was a total pain. I was really frustrated, but I headed back to work. I went to IT, gave the old equipment to Eric, picked up the supposed working equipment, and went back to the building. I did another scan and prayed it would work, and went to check on the footage. This time, I captured the room perfectly, except there was a dark figure of what looked like a man's shadow in the corner of the room. I'm not sure what this was, so I set up the equipment to do another scan, ran out of the room, and I made sure I left plenty of time for the camera to scan the entire room. Now keep in mind, I've been doing this for years, and I've never had any problems before. When I got back into the room, the camera was smashed on the ground, and the computer in the scan was incomplete. This camera had a round stand on the bottom, so it was pretty much impossible for it to tip over. Something must have picked it up and hurled it onto the ground. It was also an expensive camera and made of sturdy metal. It wasn't the type of thing to break easily. I freaked out and grabbed everything and ran out of there. I took it to IT and explained what happened. He looked at me like I was crazy, so I begged him to look at my past captures. The fog, the redness, the dark figure, and my last attempt for anything out of the ordinary. The computer read that the scan was incomplete, but Eric was able to extract what the camera had captured before it was smashed. There was a gray hand reaching down towards the camera. We both froze and stared at it. I was terrified and asked him to send me the files. I ran to my boss's office and explained to him what had happened. He accused me of lying and fired me on the spot for destroying company property and for time theft. I begged him to look at the footage and told him I wasn't lying but he had security escort me out of the building with all my stuff. Later, I called Eric to send me the files, and he told me to meet him for some coffee. At the coffee shop, Eric told me that our boss had all the files erased, and the computer that I captured it on destroyed. I still can't believe this happened to me. Why were there spirits in the building so hostile to me? I don't understand why my boss acted that way he did towards me. Why would he want the evidence destroyed? And why did he fire me so quickly? So many unanswered questions. I'm forced just to move on and get another job. I'm still in shock over everything that happened. Hi Donovan, with so many incredible stories that you tell, I don't know if you'll end up publishing this one or not, but I would appreciate your opinion on what I experienced in Missouri a few summers ago. My wife and I were overdue for a vacation, and we wanted to get out of the state and forget the world for a while. We ended up renting this amazing cottage on hundreds of acres of land in Missouri. It was gorgeous. There were rolling hills and woods as far as the eye could see, and a beautiful river that ran right through the property. My favorite thing about it all was there was a hot tub covered in lanai, where you could sit and take in the sights. I wanted to check out the whole property one day. So I followed the property line and ended up going pretty deep into the woods. The wildlife around there was incredible, and I even saw black bears and wild boars roaming around carefree. It was nature's beauty at its finest. I would love to know what that property costs. I got out to this one area of the woods where a river ran right through it, and you could follow the river for miles. I did this for a while, and I saw this big majestic bison drinking water right out of the river. I was pissed I didn't have my phone with me to take a picture, but I was determined to get as close as possible. The closer I got to it, however, the less it looked like a bison. It was huge and furry like one, but it had these jagged spikes along its back, like nothing I'd ever seen on an animal before. It also had one giant horn on top of its head like a rhino. It was the strangest looking creature I'd ever seen before. It started freaking me out the closer I got to it and I decided to keep a healthy distance between it as I had no idea what it was. It took massive gulps of water at a time. I could hear it from a decent distance away. Suddenly the beast looked at me and I was terrified. It had one giant eye and it screamed at me so loudly it shook the ground. I immediately took off into the woods. I must have been so scared that I passed out. I woke up later that night in the dark with no phone and no flashlight, miles away from the cottage. I had no idea where I was, and I didn't know what direction to start walking in. 
I was really scared, and it crossed my mind that I might die in the middle of the woods that night, with nobody around to find me. I finally found the river, and I figured I would follow the river to keep an eye out for anything that looked familiar. I kept walking and walking alongside the river, and eventually, I smelled the faint smell of a campfire. My wife must have lit one. I kept following the river, and the smell of the campfire got stronger and stronger. Finally, I saw the campfire in the cottage and made my way towards it. By this point, I was beyond exhausted, hungry, and dehydrated. I got close to the campfire, and I must have passed out again. The next thing I know, I wake up in the hospital, and my wife is sitting next to my bed. I told my wife about the nasty beast I saw. I talked about the large bison-like body and jagged spikes across its back the giant horns on its head, and the most unusual part, its big singular eye. My wife told me I was just hallucinating from dehydration, and I just needed to rest. The nurse came in to check on me, and I told her all about this creature I saw. She told me about an urban legend that was unique to Missouri, called the Mini Washitu, which fit the exact physical characteristics that I described. When I looked it up, it said that anybody who saw it became crazy writhed around in unspeakable pain and was only relieved from these ailments through inevitable death. Luckily, I never experienced any of those awful things, and I am still very much alive to tell the tale. It has me believing, however, that maybe what I saw wasn't a -a one-of-a-kind creature, but more of a common creature that was relatively rare and commonly mistaken as a mythical one. I will say one thing, though. The beast's scream was the worst thing that I'd ever heard to this day. The scream was not an ordinary roar of an animal. It shook me and everything around it, and it made me immediately fear for my safety and for my life. Everyone I tell this story to stops believing me the minute I mentioned it had one eye. But that's the part that's burnt into my memory. What a hideous creature I saw that day. I'll never forget seeing it, and I hope I never see it or anything like it again. Let me know if you have any insight on what this creature could have been. Hey Donovan, I've got a story to tell you. I'm still processing it. In all honesty, my therapist says it's better to talk about it than to keep it all bottled up inside. So I'll start off with a bit about me. My name's Sam and I'm in junior college at the University of Maine. I'm studying environmental science and engineering. I'm a big hiker and I love to get outdoors in any capacity. Running, skiing, tubing, fishing, whatever it is. They're all just peaceful activities. And my therapist says it's good for me because it gives me some time away from my anxiety in peace and quiet. I even got into bird watching. I'm not too skilled at bird watching, but I've gotten better this last semester because I took a class in ornithology. There are a few main points to birding that I learned. You always need a good pair of binoculars, and a field guide can be your best friend. But your ears can be your most useful tool. Birds make all kinds of different calls depending on what they're trying to communicate. They might call for a mate, or that they spotted food, or as a warning, or to communicate directions or to signal danger. Some birds have lots of different calls and sounds and songs, and they usually have a variety of different pitches and vocalizations along with them. I've memorized most of the common sounds here in the Northeast, and you can do a pretty good job matching them up with the correct bird. I've also been out hiking enough to recognize the look of most, depending on if they're a male or female, or a fledging, or an adult, or a senior. That's a lot to learn, and I've been determined to learn it all. I've been going out almost every morning on the weekends to see what I can find. Early morning is usually the best time for birding, because it's not too hot for them, and some of their predators aren't up yet, or have just gone to bed. You know what they say, the early bird gets the worm. I had been hiking for about a mile at Moose Point State Park, and I had seen a lot of different birds. I started to hike up a hill to get a better viewpoint, and maybe catch some overstory birds flying by. I found a path that winded up the mountain and took me to this perfect aerial viewing in a clearing. I sat down and took a breather. It wasn't long before I felt a shadow fly over me. I looked up as quickly as I could, but I didn't see anything in the sky. Then I heard some rustling in the trees. I pulled out my binoculars and tried to get a better look. 
All I could see is this black wing popping in and out of a massive pine tree. The entire trunk was swaying back and forth as needles and branches flew out in all directions. All of a sudden, this creature popped out of the tree line. I thought it could have been a vulture or a raptor or an eagle, but the wings were far too large, and its face wasn't like a bird at all. In fact, the most shocking thing was it didn't really have a face at all. Only these bright red eyes that were tracking something down below. It had the body of a person almost, but it was covered in this thin layer of black fuzz. Its wings were huge and spread out almost two yards wide. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. It started to dart down below the trees and I stood up with my binoculars to follow it. For a while, the whole forest was silent and then I heard this deer crying in pain. The leaves on another tree shook and then out of the clearing below, this creature came flying by with a doe stuck between its talons. It was a bit off kilter from carrying its weight, but it flapped its huge wings smoothly nonetheless. I followed the beast with my binoculars for as long as I could, but eventually it was out of my sight for good. I sat there in shock for a while and then made my way down the hill to get out of that forest. As I approached the area where the deer got scooped up from, I saw a mess of fallen trees, broken branches, and leaves strewn all about. Certainly a struggle had taken place. I got out of there as quickly as I could and spent the rest of the day googling what I had seen. Although it seems unlikely to have been this far north, I do believe I saw what you call a mothman. It certainly was not a normal bird or a bat. If this thing was able to pick up an adult deer, would it be able to pick up me too? I'm a park ranger working in the Grand Canyon National Park. I usually end up on daily patrols and bus kids for drinking near the edge of the canyon. Sometimes I write citations and tickets for camping violations and reports about wildlife issues. Once in a while, we'll have a missing persons case. Lately, these cases have been becoming more and more common. Now, the first few missing campers they broadcast on the news. The first one was a girl last May. She was that hippie free spirit type, driving her van all through the states, stopping in all the best campsites and all the best parks all over. She was all by herself and no one even noticed she was gone till they hadn't seen her posts on her Instagram in a few weeks. Her last calls and texts were to her family on the same day that she last posted. Her phone was turned off for good that same day, and the geotag pinpointed her in the desert. We sent out a search party, over 100 people canvassing the area. It's pretty tough to survive out in the desert. There's no water, no food, and it's scorching hot during the day and cold at night. We found her van parked and nothing seemed abnormal. She had some almonds soaking in a jar to make almond milk or something. She was planning on coming back to that van. It had been a week, so at that point we assumed that we were looking for a body. We didn't find many signs out there in the desert of her at all. The only thing that we found that could have been hers was a little fanny pack with some granola bars in it. Really, we don't even know if that was hers or not. The canine rescue team seemed to think so. In all though, it was like she vanished into thin air. Now, a young girl going missing is sad, but it isn't too out of the ordinary. There's bad men out there, and a pretty little thing like that is vulnerable. Plus, there's high rocks and sandstorms and risk of heat exhaustion. If you're traveling without a guide, you're even at bigger risk of trouble. It started to get more odd when more and more people were going missing. A young man from Idaho traveling with his girlfriend went to pee behind a rock near Mather Point and never walked back over. There were tons of tourists and hikers nearby. No one saw anything weird and there weren't any caves or craters around. He just up and vanished. An onlooker had stated they had seen a blue light flash during the situation, but no one else corroborated their story. The news never mentioned this and the papers left it out too. Some people on Facebook suspected the light could have been a rescue flare or a flashlight. I don't think so. The next problem was a family camping out in the trailers. There were a pack of RVers, a husband, a wife, two sons about 10 and 12 years old. 
They'd set out to hike the North Rim and left around 8 a.m. They'd signed the check-in sheets and denied the opportunity to have a local guide with them. By evening, when they hadn't signed out, we sent out a search party. Helicopters and dog teams and tons of volunteers went over the next few weeks. There was nothing coming up. There didn't seem to be any evidence of foul play. There weren't any storms or abnormalities. There weren't any signs of wildlife. No mountain lions anywhere in the area. And they definitely couldn't have taken down a whole family of four. A husband and wife went missing next. There isn't a ton of information about them. But we think the husband was live streaming right as they went missing. The video footage was scrubbed from the internet. But one of their friends described the clip to me as a witness in our investigation. They told me that the video showed them hiking towards the edge of the canyon, where we think is the Bright Angel Trailhead. The wife was walking backwards and laughing, when all of a sudden she disappeared from view. The husband dropped down the phone and gasped, and then a bright blue light overtook the screen. At that point, the video feed ended. We went to check out the site. We didn't find anything out of the ordinary. Of course, we canvassed the area and sent out yet another search crew. But at this point, the entire ranger team were all feeling dejected and like the entire operation was pointless. We'd been staying up long nights on these search teams and hadn't solved a single thing. Well, the story starts to get really interesting when the black vans started rolling in. I don't know if they were FBI, CIA, NSA, or NASA or what. Maybe some program we don't even know about yet. But they are definitely interested in whatever is going on around the canyon. They've set up shop in a big lot with a tall barbed wire fence surrounding the area. There's always those black vans going out all hours of the day and night. They drive all through the park, but I'm not sure they always go back in once they've gone out. Well, I've looked over there with my binoculars some nights. Don't judge me. I've started to see those blue lights flash once in a while. Usually it's through the windows of some warehouse, but they sometimes just appear out of nowhere, right out in the middle of the lot. The lights just pop up for an instant and they're gone. Whatever is going on, I don't want any part of it. I hope those folks are the good guys, and maybe they'll be able to figure out what's going on with those missing people lately. I just hope that they're not the ones causing the issue. Hi Donovan, I'm not sure who else to tell my story to. Everyone will say I'm crazy, or that my imagination ran away with me. But it was the most chilling thing that I've ever seen, and it shook my belief system to the core. I can no longer say what's possible or impossible. Everyone knows Savannah is reported to be one of America's most haunted cities. I've visited several times, and even stayed in rooms that were supposed to be hotbeds of supernatural activity. But I never saw anything, not even an orb. Savannah's a great place to visit anyway, so I stopped ghost hunting and booked a weekend trip with my sister just to relax. We weren't planning on doing anything spooky. I don't know if you or anyone else hearing this is familiar with Factors Walk in Savannah. Factors Walk is a multi-level brick and cobblestone area dividing two streets along the Savannah River. It kind of looks like a back alley behind the waterfront restaurants, but it's a very interesting historical area. Reportedly, there are tunnel systems running all under Savannah for a whole host of reasons. The tunnels that are now sealed over at Factors Walk were used mostly for transporting slaves unloading from the ships in secret, away from prying eyes. There are also tunnels under certain restaurants that claim they were used by nefarious sea captains to Shanghai unsuspecting tavern patrons, forcing them into service at sea. So Factors Walk area, like most of Savannah, is supposed to be haunted. But I'm not done with ghost chasing. So after my sister and I had purchased refreshments from a local cafe, I decided to sit and people watch on a nearby bench while investigating the Klusky vaults. The Klusky vaults were built in 1840 and are open to the public to explore. Some people speculate they were once passageways that connected the Klusky vaults to the rest of the tunnel network. Today, the vaults look like underground storage units, just big, dark rooms built with brick and stone set in the side of an embankment. 
My sister walked inside the first one, and I let my gaze wander, thinking about where we should eat dinner. After a few minutes, I looked up and I didn't see her. You can't see all the way inside the vaults from where I was sitting, so I wasn't concerned, until a few minutes later when she hadn't reappeared. I watched for a few minutes more staring at the four different entrances, unsure if she had merged and popped out into a different vault to explore. I started to become concerned and stood up, intending to find her. I took a few steps forward and called her name. Suddenly she appeared, standing in the doorway of the same vault I had seen her enter. I walked in her direction and she was staring at me with this bright smile on her face. But her face looked weird, shiny, almost plastic. I was about 25 feet away at the time. She didn't look quite like herself, but it was hard to say what was off. Maybe her eyes, sharp and glittering. They looked a little unmatched, like maybe they were set at slightly different heights from each other. Her grin looked lopsided and fake, and stuck in the same expression. There was something not quite right about her, and she didn't speak, she just stared at me with that weird, unchanging grin. Lynn? I walked closer, frowning. Are you okay? I had gotten about 15 feet away when she abruptly turned and walked back into the vault. I thought maybe it was some kind of joke, like she knew I wasn't into the spooky stuff anymore, and she was planning on popping out and scaring me when I followed her inside. You know, just for laughs. So I stopped right where I was and I called her name. Lynn! I know I sounded impatient. Then I heard it, my sister's voice calling to me. Not from inside the vault, but from behind me. I whirled around and there was Lynn, frowning as she walked towards me. What's going on? She asked. She still had the coffee cup from Cafe M in her hand. I stared at her totally uncomprehending. Where were you? I asked. The hairs on my arms started to rise and I felt goosebumps. She pointed to the row of vaults to her right. I checked them all out. I just came out of the last one and you were standing there calling my name. What's going on? My knees felt weak. What had I seen? It looked like Lynn. No, correction. It looked like something that was trying to look like Lynn, but not quite succeeding. I must have gone pale, because Lynn grabbed my arm and steered me back over to the bench. I kept my eyes fixed on that first vault while I told her what had happened, but nothing ever emerged. She told me then the first vault had felt really uncomfortable to her and she'd spent less than a minute inside. It felt so claustrophobic and depressing. There was this sense of dark energy in there with me, she said. We both just stared at that first vault, wondering what it had been. What sort of creature could take on the appearance of my sister? Anne stepped forth into the sunlight. Had it tried to lure me in there? For what purpose? Do you want to go in there and look, Lynn asked me. She sounded scared too. I shook my head, most definitely not. Whatever was in there, trying to escape from that vault on Factor's Walk, was not something I ever wished to encounter again. The craziest thing happened to me a couple of years ago, when my friends and I rented this cabin in the middle of the woods for a couple of nights. We were celebrating a friend's birthday, so we all pitched in and split the cost of an Airbnb. This place was gorgeous, with amazing views all around. There were mountain views as far as the eye could see, and a beautiful creek running right through the property. There was nobody around, just wildlife and beautiful nature. That night we had a nice fire going, and we were just relaxing and laughing. We heard this strange echoing laughter coming from the woods. We all just froze and stayed quiet, listening to hear it again. A while passed and we just kind of brushed it off. Then about a half hour later, we hear the sound again. Creepy, haunting laughter. We decided to investigate. We grabbed some flashlights and headed into the forest. We entered the woods and started looking around with our flashlights. We didn't see or hear anything, so we went deeper into the forest. We stopped again and just listened for a while, but we didn't hear any noise. We were about to head back when a beautiful blonde woman in a long flowered dress walked over to us. She asked who we were, and we told her that we were renting the cabin nearby and heard a strange sound in the woods. 
She asked what sound we heard, and we told her it was a strange, creepy laugh. The woman told us that she hadn't laughed since her beloved husband was brutally stabbed to death in the middle of the night. None of us knew what to say. I just said, sorry for your loss. She thanked me and invited us to come over to her home and further investigate the strange sound. We agreed and followed her through the woods and to her home. We arrived at this pretty little cottage with a garden in the front, and she said that was her house and she brought us in. We sat down in the living room and she started making us some tea. She asked us how long we had been searching for the source of the sound, and we told her a little over an hour. She said that other people that have rented that Airbnb have claimed to have heard strange sounds coming from the forest, but to her knowledge, nobody ever found anything. I asked her what kind of sounds people heard. She said that people have heard screams, cries, and strange animal sounds, but never laughter. When we asked her if she had ever heard anything, she said there are all kinds of wicked things around here. I asked her why she didn't move. She said that her husband had built the house and all of her fondest memories were in this house. We sat in the living room talking about all kinds of crazy things until very late. We were all exhausted and figured it was time to head back to the cabin and call it a night. Shortly after we left, we hear the laughter again, this time very loudly. It was as if the laughter was coming from the blonde woman's house. When we looked back, we saw a woman peering through her window at us. It wasn't the same woman. She had gray skin and black hair and black eyes, and an evil, nasty grin. We ran back to the cabin as quickly as we could, and we kept hearing the laughter trail off behind us. We immediately packed up and drove down the road. We stopped at a motel that we passed and spent the night there. The next morning, we got breakfast at a local diner, and we started talking about what had happened. We looked at the reviews on the Airbnb, and several people claimed the house was haunted. Multiple people claimed they heard creepy sounds coming from the forest. A couple even mentioned the blonde woman and how nice and how hospitable she was. One review said evil lurks there and never go there. Another review said a horrible witch demon. My friend had booked a cabin. I have no idea why he didn't read the reviews. This was too much. Multiple people had similar experiences that we just had, and we got to read them all freshly afterwards. There was no denying that the experience we had was unexplainable, but it was relieving to hear that we weren't the only victims. Now when I rent an Airbnb, I make sure I read all of the reviews thoroughly. That is an experience that I never want to have again. I grew up in a suburb that was between New York and Philadelphia. It was pretty rural when I was a kid. My development was surrounded by farms. By the time I got to high school, more houses were being built as people moved away from the big cities for a lower cost of living. Things really started to change when online shopping took off. All the cheap farmland within a two hour drive of New York and Philly was bought up by corporations and turned into shipping hubs, warehouses, and Amazon fulfillment centers. The whole thing really divided people. Most agreed that the prefab metal warehouses were an eyesore, but others argued that they brought in a lot of jobs and helped the local economy. Traffic got worse. The open fields and trees disappeared. It was all kind of sad, really, but it did help the economy, so I guess I shouldn't complain too much. I moved back in with my parents during the pandemic. I work a remote marketing job, so it was a pretty easy move. I wanted to get out of Philly for the shutdowns, while I was home, I really saw how much the landscape had changed. I noted all the new warehouses and storage facilities, but there was one in particular that caught my eye. My dad likes to hunt pheasants and roughed grouse, so we always had bird dogs growing up, English setters, Brittany spaniels, and the German short-haired pointers to be specific. Anyone who grew up with working dog breeds know they're high energy and they require a lot of exercise. As the remote worker in the house, it fell on me to walk the dog every day. These aren't normal leash walks around the block. We always let our dog run free through the fields in the thickets for an hour or two. Unfortunately, there was only one or two fields left for him to run in. It was also on these walks that I noticed something strange about one of the new warehouses built just outside my parents' development. 
For starters, it was separated from any other buildings at the far end of the field, with a long driveway connecting it to the road. The driveway looped around to the back of the building, where there was a loading dock that was shielded from prying eyes by a thick patch of woods behind it. All of the other warehouses in the area were built in clusters to reduce cost and allowed them to share the common roadways and loading docks for the trucks. But this isolated warehouse looked like it was purposely built to be inconvenient. I didn't think too much of the isolated warehouse at first, but, but as I noticed more weird details about it on my walks, I started to suspect that something was going on in there. There were no windows and only one entrance on the back of the building. The door had large concrete block in front of it, with a narrow slit. It looked like something an archer would hide behind in a castle in Game of Thrones. There was no fence around the structure, but while my dog was roaming the field, I noticed poles stuck in the ground with these dome-shaped cameras on top. I could hear the mechanical motors whining as the cameras panned inside their cases to watch me. I never saw a no trespassing or private property sign so I continued to let my dog run around the property on her morning walks. The fourth or fifth time I was walking in the field, something glinting in the sun on top of the building caught my eye. When I got closer, I saw the glint was from the glass of a spotting scope. Two men were on the roof watching me. This is the first time I was spooked by the whole situation. If it was a singular guy with binoculars, it would be one thing. But the spotting scope in the second guy made me think of those military movies where the sniper teams had one guy spotting while the other guy was shooting. I cut the walk short and went home. I didn't go back there for a few weeks. The more I thought about the incident, the more I convinced myself that I was being ridiculous. No warehouse in the suburbs would have a sniper team on the roof. I was just letting my imagination go wild after seeing the cameras. Regular businesses care about corporate espionage, so there's nothing suspicious about having basic security. Plus, it wasn't like I actually saw a gun on the roof, just two guys watching me, one with some optics. So I went back to the field because it was the only good place to let my dog off the leash within walking distance of my parents' house. The dog got himself wedged deep into a thicket chasing after squirrels. I could hear him rustling around in the trees but he wouldn't listen to any of my commands, so I trudged in there after him. I came out on the other side of the trees, at the back of the warehouse where the loading dock and entrance were. Standing at the edge of the thicket was an angry looking man holding my dog by the collar. I approached him slowly and tried to force a smile. As I approached, I saw the man subtly place his hand on his hip. It was then I noticed he was wearing jeans and a dark jacket. This was a few months into the pandemic, in June or July. It was way too hot to be wearing long pants and a jacket. This was a huge red flag for me, but I needed to get my dog. You can't be here, he said. Sorry, there wasn't any signs. I've always walked my dog here, I replied. He clenched his jaw and just pushed my dog towards me. That's when I noticed a line of vehicles coming up the driveway. They looked like they were driving in a formation. An 18-wheeler was being escorted by two black SUVs in front and two behind. The man stepped in front of me to block my view. He laid a hand on my chest, his other hand still hovering over the jacket pocket, and told me I had to leave the property right now. I don't know what's going on in that warehouse, but I'm convinced that it's either a government site or some large powerful corporation that wants to keep it hidden from the public eye. Either way. I don't go back there anymore. Hello there, Donovan. I'm a retired police officer, and some of the stories I could tell you would make everybody respect us and what we go through daily so much more. It was truly a thankless job. Nobody likes a police officer, but you need one when you need one. I will admit there were bad apples in our department. But most of my fellow officers get into their careers to help people and to protect their community. I've had some unbelievable experiences, but I've only had one true paranormal experience that made me a believer. There are things that can't be explained. There's no such thing as coincidences, and we don't understand everything that's going on in this world. 
One night I received a call about an elderly woman hearing someone trying to break into her house through her attic. I put my lights and siren on and headed there as fast as I could. When I got there, she frantically swung open the door and screamed, Thank God you showed up. Thank God you came. I ran over to her and asked her where the burglar was coming from. She showed me the attic door and I crawled up to see what was going on. I searched that entire attic and didn't find anything out of the ordinary. There were boxes piled up and some pieces of furniture, but not a person trying to break into her house. There were no signs of human entry, and the window up there was locked, so I climbed back down the ladder. I told the woman she should get an exterminator, because if she heard something, it was more likely an animal. There was no way anybody was up there. She insisted that it was a person trying to get in, and even claimed that it was talking to her saying things like, I'm going to get you and let me out. Just to give her some peace of mind, I went up there and looked around for a while. I checked every square inch of that attic, and even opened boxes and looked inside. It's amazing what junk people save. I crawled back down the ladder and assured her that she is perfectly safe and that I didn't find a single living thing up there. She started crying and pleading with me, and said that whatever was up there was trying to get her in the night. I suggested that she stay with a friend or family member, and I told her I'd to respond to another call. The woman kept calling 911 repeatedly that night, and continued doing so every day after that. I would go by and check on her once a day, and she would be hysterical every time I saw her, telling me some of the things that the person up there threatened to do to her. The threat she would describe kept getting more and more gruesome, and she didn't seem like the type of person to use that type of vocabulary. But I kept going up into the attic to appease her and finding absolutely nothing. Weeks passed and this became a regular part of my job. It was starting to wear on me. I explained to her that I could be out helping other people that really needed it instead of going up in her attic. But she was adamant that something was up there. I'll tell you something though, I never thought she was doing it for attention. I did figure that she was getting older and more senile and was imagining things but I believe she was experiencing something awful. I recommended she talk to a psychiatrist and told her to get a paranormal investigator to look into her attic. I didn't believe in any of that stuff, but I was desperate to help her get some relief, and I was really getting sick of going over there so needlessly. She agreed to do both, and I went to respond to another call. The next time I saw her, she told me that the paranormal investigators told her it was the most amount of activity they had documented in over five years. This actually freaked me out, and I went back up into the attic again. I felt something sinister in that attic, but I kept telling myself that it was just my imagination reacting to whatever she had told me. Loudly enough for the lady to hear, I kept repeating, If you're not here for her greatest good, leave now and forever, and the power of Christ compels you. Both of these I have heard in movies about exorcisms, and was mainly just doing so so she would believe me that the spirits were gone. I left after a while, and she thanked me over and over again on my way out. That night, she was brutally murdered in her sleep. To this day, it's the most horrific crime that I've ever witnessed. She was stabbed multiple times over her entire body. Her face was unrecognizable, and some of her organs were pulled out of her and many other details that I just won't share. I get nauseous even thinking about it. Forensics couldn't find a single piece of evidence, and the lady was beloved in the community. We couldn't figure out a single person that would want to do this to her, and our community is still devastated by this tragedy. One thing that still actively haunts me is that the attic door was wide open on the night she was murdered. I know I closed it after I left that night, it could just be coincidence, that's what I've told myself multiple times, but it's the worst thing that I've ever seen, and I don't know how any person could have done something like this. I never talked to anyone who had anything bad to say about her. The feeling in that attic that night, along with the paranormal investigator's claims, was enough for me to be more of a believer. The brutality of the murder and the attic being open made me completely trust the poor lady's story and I do believe that the paranormal entity that kept threatening her finally followed through with its promises.
I wanted to tell you a frightening experience I had in June. I was so rattled by this encounter that I've actually put my log cabin up for sale. There's no way I'll ever feel safe again there. I've always loved vacationing in Maine. So much of the state is undeveloped. Over the years, I've seen badgers, coyotes, bear, deer, and moose, but I've never been in fear for my life until this past summer. My vacation cabin is located in Azacoast Lake in Maine. I go there by myself to relax at least three times a year. During the winter, it's difficult, as you need to drive nine miles through rough logging roads, which are unplowed in the winter. I've skied in over the lake a time or two, but it's pretty exhausting. These days, I tend to just go when I can drive all the way in. I went up there in June and had a pleasant week, bird watching, hiking, listening to the loons cry on the lake. Toward the end of my stay, I decided to hike the trail that led to an overlook of the Androscoggin Valley. It was deemed difficult by the hiking book I have, but I was wanting a new experience. I got a new experience all right. The trail was a bit tougher than I had realized, overgrown with brambles and fallen trees blocking the way. The amount of debris overtaking the trail made me think no one had used it for a very long time. I got to the first stream crossing and caught a glimpse of a fawn in a doe, which cheered me and renewed my enthusiasm. I filled my water bottle and continued on, knowing I wouldn't find any more water at the top of the mountain. The last leg of the trail involves steep rock faces, but according to the guidebook, you didn't need climbing equipment. There were enough toeholds and footholds that a relatively athletic person could navigate the boulders. I passed a few flat large rocks that looked to be a prime place to eat lunch on the way down, and filed them away for future reference. By the time I reached the top, I was sweating pretty good. I felt victorious, up there above the tree line looking down at the Androscoggin Valley. The breeze felt good cooling me down, but an unpleasant odor was carried on the wind. It smelled like death. I looked around to find the source and spotted a bit of fur visible within the tangle of the undergrowth. I walked over to look and was surprised at what I saw. It was the remains of a deer. Its head was intact, but its eyes were still wide open in fright. The legs and hooves were still recognizable, but my stomach turned as I viewed the rest. Its entire torso had been ripped apart. All that was left was a hollow rib cage. I felt queasy looking down at it and backed away quickly. It ruined my enjoyment of the overlook, so I decided to get away from the smell and climb back down to the flat rocks. At that point, lunch was the furthest thing from my mind, but I thought it would be nice just to sit there and relax. Within 10 minutes, I had descended to the rock field and chose a nice flat rock. I sat cross-legged and turned my face up to the sun, trying to savor the last bit of vacation I had. Suddenly, I heard a crashing in the bushes above me. I was startled because it sounded like something very large. I turned my head to see, scanning the bushes, hoping it wasn't a bear. As soon as I started looking around, the noises stopped. It was eerily silent. No birds and even the wind had calmed down. I tried to relax, trying to get back into my zen state, but I felt anxious. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was watching me. I decided to head back. It would take about a half hour, I guessed, as it took an hour to climb up. I stood and scanned the trail above me once more, but nothing moved. So I started my descent. Every couple of minutes, I would hear a twig snap or leaves rustle. I would stop and wait, holding my breath, listening, and be greeted by silence. As soon as I began to move again, so would the noises. I finally stopped and called out, Hello? My voice sounded pitifully anxious. I waited, but there was no reply. I knew I wasn't imagining it. Something was following me. My heart started beating really fast, and I had the urge to run. I tried to calm myself down, but all I could think was, if it wasn't a person following me, then it was some sort of animal predator. I was so glad to see the cabin 50 yards ahead of me that I broke into a dead run. Immediately, I heard a snarling sound behind me, and my throat closed with fear. I knew instinctively that the animal that had been stalking me was now rushing to attack. I dropped my pack and raced to the door, getting inside and sliding the bolt. I ran to the window to look out, and I couldn't believe my eyes. I've never seen anything like it. My heart started pounding so hard I felt like my head would explode. 
The creature was frightening large, about seven or eight feet tall and it looked like a werewolf. I know that's ridiculous, but it was on two legs and it had the head and fur of a dog. It was barrel chested and extremely muscular with its front limbs hanging low about to its knees. I shrank back from the window feeling so scared and sick, like I was going to faint. I heard the long claws scrape at my wooden door, scratching and growling, and I slid down the wall sitting on the floor praying it couldn't get in. I could hear it moving around the perimeter of the cabin, and a horrible stench like a wet dog began to waft through the cracks in the logs. Suddenly its head appeared in the window, and I got a good look at its face. It looked like a creature from hell. A dog's muzzle, large fangs like a wolf, and these glowing yellow eyes. It was peering in trying to locate me in my cabin. I stayed still and quiet, frozen with fear, hoping it wasn't smart enough to break the glass. A few minutes passed and it finally moved away. I could hear tearing noises as it found my backpack, and then there was silence. I waited a long time before moving, my legs going numb on the cabin floor. I was afraid to give away my location if it was just faking me out. Even though I was terrified, I made myself slide over to the window and look out. It was gone. My backpack was in shreds. It was almost evening and I was too afraid to walk the short distance to where I was parked. I stayed awake all night with the door bolted, afraid to even go out and use the outhouse. As soon as the full light of dawn broke, I made a run for it, getting into my truck and heading back down the mountain doors locked and stopping for no one. I haven't been back, I can't explain what I saw, but it has ruined my little cabin forever. I might buy a different place if this one sells, but it won't be. Hi Donovan, this happened just last week where I lost my cat. I don't mean that he's lost, but rather I saw him get eaten by this thing in the field behind my yard. Let me back up for a second. The last few weeks I've been noticing some strange noises in my yard in the evening, around dusk time. Like this chirping sound, almost like a bullfrog, but different, slightly more high pitched. After hearing this sound, I've seen movement in my backyard around the pond. There's tall grass around the pond because I only mow it every few months. It looked like something was running back and forth from the woods to the pond. But since the grass is so high, I really couldn't make out what it was. Then last week, I'm watching my long haired cat from my back deck as I'm having a drink on the deck. He goes trotting off towards the woods and then he sees something he wants to pounce on. I thought it was a mouse or something small because I couldn't see anything from the deck and he's always bringing up dead mice to the back deck. So he's crouched down and then he takes off. As soon as he takes off, this lizard type creature grabs him by the neck and bites him and starts eating him. It was a terrible sight to see. I went into the house to grab my shotgun and I was going to empty it on this thing, but it was gone by the time I came back. I was only in the house for maybe 10 seconds. So now I lost my cat and I have this creature behind my house. I called animal control and they came out, but they couldn't find anything. I'm at a loss of what to do. I've never seen anything like this before. It stood maybe three or four feet tall, and it had these long black claws, but it looked like it only had two or three of them. And it was scaly like a lizard, but it was standing on its two legs, which really was freaky. I don't know if anybody in your audience has ever seen anything like this, but it ate my cat. Hey there, Donovan. I've never seen a ghost or anything like that, but one time I saw an animal that freaked me out. Looking back, this is probably what initially sparked my obsession with all things paranormal. I've told this story to a lot of people, and I've had a few say that I was lying and just making this up. It just goes to show you that people's ignorance knows no bounds. Thanks for providing an ever-growing forum where people can share their experiences and gather insight instead of receiving judgment. My dad owns about 50 acres of land, and over the years, we've made a four-wheeler trail that's nothing short of epic. It's got everything, steep inclines, long winding declines, 
and a couple of ramps where you can get some serious air. A mud pit and untamed wilderness as far as the eye can see. I love going there to clear my head. There's nobody else around. And there's something about being alone in nature that calms and centers me. Many years ago, I was four-wheeling on the trail late at night when I smelt something awful. We had some problems with people dumping trash on our property a couple of times. So I figured this is what I was dealing with. I went off the trail and headed towards the source of the smell. This was a rancid smell, enough to gag a maggot. My eyes started tearing up the closer I got to it. My four-wheeler's headlights revealed a large animal feasting on a smaller animal up ahead and realized that this might be the source of the smell. If one dead animal smelt this bad, I had to figure out what it was. As I got closer to the creature, I realized that it was huge and looked nothing like I've ever seen before in my life. It was the size of a bear with spikes on its back. It looked like a giant wolf without any hair. Its eyes were gigantic and awful. The creature looked right at me, dropped the carcass and started snarling at me. The sounds this beast made were awful. It sounded like a big rabid dog's growl, but it was human-like and sounded demonic. It made low bellowing sounds and then high-pitched pain groans. I don't know exactly how to describe it, but I've never heard an animal sound anything like that. I was terrified and knew I needed to get the hell out of there as fast as I could. I gassed it out of there as fast as that four-wheeler would take me. As I made my way back to the trail, I heard those demonic grunts behind me. I thought I was going to die. I tried to swerve the four-wheeler in an unpredictable pattern as I headed back to the house. Finally, I didn't hear the beast anymore, and I made it safely back to the house. I told my dad what had happened and he grabbed the shotgun and headed out into the woods. We searched all over but couldn't find the creature. When we got to the location where I first saw the beast, the small animal carcass was still there, but it was nowhere to be found. What was strange was that the little animal was mostly intact, despite the size of the demonic naked wolf that feasted on it. Dad checked all the trail cams, but none of them caught the creature on the camera. He told me to be careful and keep an eye out for it. I began researching what I had seen in the woods, and the only thing that was coming up at first was Bigfoot. But then I learned about a creature called a chupacabra. This creature was described as five to six feet tall, wolf-like in appearance, and it has spikes on its back, and it doesn't have any hair. Chupa means sucker, and cabra means goat in Spanish. It was called goat sucker because it was often found sucking the blood out of animals such as goats. Could this thing in the woods have sucked all this poor animal's blood out? I'm not saying with 100% certainty that the creature that I saw was a chupacabra, but out of all the animals that I've researched, this is the only one that I've found that matches what I saw. I hope I never see it again, but I've looked for it a lot over the years. My dad and I put up more trail cams, and we put motion lights all along the trail to try to get some evidence of this creature. So far, however, we've only captured deer, dogs, and turkeys. But having motion lights so you can ride the trail at night is awesome. So maybe I should be thanking the beast. Thanks for reading my story. I can't believe I'm telling this story. I was eight or nine years old and I was a very quiet kid. It was a good way for me to escape since my mom was such an emotional abuser. During that time, I was really into mystery stories. My dad was frustrated with me because he wanted me to read biographies and stuff like that to improve my mind. I liked those too, but I couldn't get enough of the mysteries. I guess I fancied myself an amateur detective after reading so many. I had changed schools a lot since my dad was always searching for the one that jived with his quirky views. That year, he had enrolled me in a parochial school. We had to wear uniforms every day. It was pretty rigid, but I liked my teachers except for Sister Virgilis, our religion teacher. She was ancient. She looked like she was about 100 years old. Nothing against old people, I love old people. She wore the full-length traditional black habit with all the accessories that go along with nun life. She looked so mean and was so strict and grouchy, probably for a good reason. Since I was so quiet, it wasn't easy for me to make friends. I did have one friend though. Her name was Brenda 
and we really bonded over our mutual love for mysteries. The school didn't have a playground, so at recess every day, they would take us across the street to play at this park. The teachers were very lenient when we were outside, and we were allowed to roam all over. At one corner of the park, there was this really old white brick building. Brenda and I were obsessed with this building. All the doors and windows were bricked up, so the whole thing was just a giant white brick structure. But you could see the outlines where the doors and the windows had been just faint lines. We would spend most of recess going round and round and examining the place. We always hoped we'd be able to find a way in. We got our hopes up for a while, then we discovered some stairs down to an old cellar door. That was the only door not bricked in, but it was nailed shut. The only other access was the old mail slot next to where the entrance door had been. You could still push that mail slot in and look. Why would they leave that unbricked? When we looked through there, all that we could see was a dark cavernous room and a bunch of tables. The place really had a feel of an old asylum, but it was completely unmarked. Brenda and I were convinced beyond a doubt that something was going on in there, mainly because of the clicking sounds. I meant it obviously seemed completely abandoned, but if you listened at the mail slot, there were these intermittent clicking sounds. There was no pattern to the sounds but we heard them regularly. It was too loud to be an insect, but it sounded like it came from something alive. Well, one night in the fall, the school was having an open house. It was a chance for parents to talk to teachers and for students to show off their work. The whole school was buzzing with all those people making their way through, checking out all of the classrooms. Brenda grabbed my hand and pulled me over to the refreshments table so we could steal some cookies. We weren't supposed to take anything until all the presentations were done. I had just gotten a hold of a cookie bar when an old hand came on top of mine. I looked up and saw Sister Virgilis glaring down at me. I snatched my hand away and ran down the hall with Brenda. We burst through the front door and ran across the street to the park. We had never been there before at night. We were standing in the middle of the park and we looked over at that building. The outlines around the windows and doors were glowing. Just hairline cracks of light shaped like windows and doors. It was the most surreal thing ever. We whispered to each other and agreed to quietly approach the building. I can't even believe we went over there. It was like our detective personas kicked in and we weren't even appropriately afraid. As we got closer to the mail slot, we started hearing those clicking sounds again. They were much louder than we ever heard them before. We crouched down slowly and pushed the mail slot and looked in. There were several lanterns around the tables like the kind you would take camping, like Coleman lanterns. There were two unnaturally tall and skinny men standing at one of the tables. They had no clothing and they were incredibly pale. The clicking sounds seemed to be coming from them. They were crouched around something laying under a sheet on the table. We couldn't tell at all what was under that sheet, but it seemed to be pretty much the length of the table, like human size. Then one of the men bent its head down and the clicking got really loud. Suddenly it made some kind of contact with whatever was on the table and there was like a sharp intake of air. It reminded me of a Dementor's kiss or something, you know like in Harry Potter. The thing under the sheet started struggling and suddenly we realized we should be very afraid. We looked at each other just horrified and ran away from the building as quietly as we could. We ran back into the school and hunkered down by a window, trying to see the building, but it was hidden from our view. Sister Virgilis saw us there and thought we were hiding from her, but she was nothing at all after we had seen that. Hey there, Donovan. I'm a retired park ranger, and I used to work at a very well-known national park. I can't say the exact park, but every one of your listeners would know the park if I said it. Anyways, this isn't a long story, but I can tell you that there is indeed something going on in the deep woods that is being covered up and not talked about. I've had a dozen of these incidents occur over my time as a park ranger. When I say a dozen, I mean a dozen that I was involved with to some degree, either speaking with authorities or being directly involved myself. 
I can't count how many times I've had visitors report strange and weird encounters. The dozen incidents that I've been involved with all end the same way. Someone at the park has a close encounter with said creature. Then we blame it on a grizzly bear or some other wild animal. Now, if someone gets hurt or if something gets destroyed, it's pretty much the same thing if it can be explained. There are some times, though, where you can't explain or pass it off as an animal attack. That's when the authorities get involved. And we've been told to keep our mouth shut, and then we go through a cover-up process. I've been involved with coordinating some cleanup efforts with authorities. Now, when I say authorities, I mean the higher-ups in the government that don't want you to know what's really going on out there. There is no agency like the FBI or CIA involved. These people don't wear any identifying information that ties them to an agency. Are they some special part of the FBI or Homeland Security? Sure, maybe, but I wouldn't know and they would never speak of it. They just give instructions and tell us what to do and what not to do and that's the end of it. There is no other way. At least if you want to remain employed and not have your entire life turned upside down. I can't get into the specifics of each case, but what I can tell you is that there are certain creatures out there that defy logic, that defy our understanding as human beings, that are roaming around in national parks. Are they from another dimension? Are they created by the very government that is trying to cover up and hide their existence? Are they fallen angels? I don't know. Your guess is as good as mine, but one thing is for sure. They exist, and I've been personally involved with multiple cases of covering up their existence. I've even seen them myself. Not all of what I've been told, but several of them I've seen on multiple occasions. It is truly terrifying if you've ever experienced this, and I pray that none of your listeners is ever in that situation, because I've had plenty of nightmares and sleepless nights because of what I know and what I've seen. Keep fighting the good fight, and thanks for doing what you're doing. As a park ranger, I've had quite a few experiences that have made me question everything that I know. We're not alone out there, and there is life after death. I could go on and on about every experience I've had, but I'll tell you about a recent one that seriously wigged me out. I was instructed to remove this invasive plant species that was wreaking havoc on our native foliage. I was deep in the woods digging up the roots of this damn weed when I heard this loud cry in the distance. Hearing animal noises isn't uncommon, so I didn't pay it much mind at first, but the more I heard it, the more it sounded like a wounded puppy crying out for help. It got to the point where I couldn't ignore it anymore. I just had to rescue this poor little puppy. I kept hiking in the direction I heard the cries. It took me far into the forest off the pass that I'm familiar with, and I kept walking deep into the woods towards the sound. I eventually wandered into a Wanichi camp, and I started asking if there was a wounded animal around. Nobody knew of any, so I just kept searching. Finally, a man asked me what it sounded like, and I said it sounded like a wounded puppy. I explained to him that I'd been searching for well over an hour, and it sounds like the puppy is just around the corner, but I can't find it anywhere. He had me sit down and gave me this delicious concoction to drink. He told me that the sound I was hearing was not a dog. It was a sound that he had heard several times before. He told me that several years earlier, a boy had drowned in a lake nearby. Ever since then, his ghost has haunted that lake and has become a deathly presence. Once an innocent boy crying for help, now cries to lure people to him. When people reach out to him to get him out to the lake, the boy grabs them by their legs and pulls them underwater to drown them to death. Being skeptical, I explained to the man that it wasn't a boy's cry that I heard. It was a wounded puppy crying for help. The man was persistent, and he insisted that I should never trust the boy. He said that everyone who has ever gone to the lake to help the boy has died. And if he was calling to me, that meant I was next. I didn't believe it for a second. I was getting frustrated by this point. I just went way out of my way to help an animal, and it wasn't about to be in vain. Suddenly, I heard the cry again. See, 
That's the sound I've been hearing, I shouted. The man just shook his head. I've heard that cry many times before. I've lost several people to that cry. All I can do is warn you. It's up to you to do what's best for you. And then the man walked away, and I was left with a choice. Do I listen to some fairy tale and let a helpless animal die, or do I go rescue it and get back to dealing with the weeds? I followed the cry for another 15 minutes or so, and sure enough, I ended up at a lake. It was gorgeous, located right in between two mountains. There are some incredible sights at Yosemite National Park, but this is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life. There were trees surrounding the lake and endless mountain views as far as the eye could see in every direction. Finally, I heard the cry crystal clear, but this time it sounded different. There was a strange element to the cry. It was almost like whatever was crying was trying to hold back laughter. I looked around and there wasn't any creature that I could see. The sound kept getting louder and louder. I thought about everything the man had said, and the sound I heard wasn't a cry for help, but clearly something toying with me, something evil. I turned around and started running. I could still hear their laughter in the distance as I ran back towards a Wanichi camp. I finally made it, and I told the man I spoke to earlier everything that had happened. He told me if you hear the cry again, ignore it, and do whatever you can to get it out of your mind. The boy preys on your compassion and fear if you let him. He will drive you to drown in the lake just to escape the torment in your mind. I told a fellow park ranger about this, and he told me of a legend called the Grouse Lake Ghost. People hear his cries and end up drowning in the lake. This freaked me out that it was a known phenomenon, and I thought about how close I got to the lake. I must say the lake is absolutely gorgeous, and it's something everyone should see before they die. But for God's sake, if you hear crying or laughing, get the hell out of there. Has anyone else ever experienced this? Or has anyone else ever heard of the Grouse Lake Ghost? Thanks for reading my story. Every summer I go to a new place and spend time away from everybody. It helps me get my bearings before I get overwhelmed by the constant pressure. Since I started teaching years ago, I've realized you've got to grab time for yourself whenever you can. I try to treat myself to a hike after school when I can. The kids are great and I wouldn't have it any other way, but they are relentless. The drama of 30 kids stuck in a classroom is hard to imagine if you haven't been there. When the school year ends, I'm so wrung out that I go home and can't move for quite a while. I usually let myself be a total sloth and hope I come out of it soon. And I have to, obviously. There's no choice but to use the downtime to work on everything that's fallen apart at the house. There's no time to deal with it during the school year. It takes me a month to feel like I've put things in order enough to look around a bit. That means it's usually the beginning of August before I start planning a trip. This time I wanted to see the Redwoods. I had been around them a bit when I was a teenager, but I always wanted to go back. I wanted to camp right in the middle of them. This was when the internet was just getting going, so it was a lot harder to plan your trip details. I found a spot that I liked, Jedediah Smith State Park. It's close to the California-Oregon border. There were no Google Maps back then, but I figured there was something better than my paper maps. I got on my computer and I think I got MapQuest or something. I plugged in the starting point and the destination I got these line by line written instructions. It was a lot. I printed it out and had several pages of directions. I didn't even have to read through them. I guess I figured the map robots must know what they're talking about. By then it was around my birthday, August 5th. So I had two weeks to get out and back and be ready for school. I got my camper gear thrown together and tossed it all in my Jeep. It was a pretty unorganized trip since I left so late, but I was glad to get out of there and on the road. I took my pages of unread directions and headed out. Everything was going fine until I got to Winnemucca. I was traveling on the usual highways very straightforward. I stopped at some cafe and got something to eat. I went in and ate in my Jeep and started looking over my directions. I had reached some kind of crossroads and the instructions had me leaving the main highway and getting on an old state highway. I trusted the maps and got back behind the wheel. I was on a two-lane road and huge trucks were passing by going like 80 miles an hour. 
It was close to midnight and pitch black since the street lamps had disappeared. Still okay, but then I was randomly instructed to turn onto a dirt road. I started questioning my sanity because this road didn't seem like it led anywhere people wanted to go. I was really naive then and just kept going. After about 20 miles of dusty bumping along, all this strange wildlife started to appear. These big birds kept swooping in front of my car. They were beige in color. They looked about a foot long. I thought birds slept at night. Then all these giant jackrabbits started appearing. There were dozens of them. So tall and jumping in front of my car. I had to keep slamming on my brakes. They didn't seem to have any regard for vehicles at all. I think I hit one of them, but there was no way I was stopping. I saw some kind of animals with horns. I don't know what they were. I kept catching glimpses of them out of the corner of my eye. And some other animal kept shrieking. I mean, I was surrounded by the most surreal wildlife. I had to go pretty slow because of the potholes. I came to a spot with such a deep hole that I couldn't drive through it. So I turned into a field to go around. Out of nowhere, something descended out of the sky with this blinding blue light and hovered about a hundred feet in the air. I stopped at my tracks and realized that it was totally silent. My high beams were on and in front of me were these carcasses laid in a circle, a real variety of them. And in the middle of the circle, more carcasses laid in an X, like X marks the spot. The blue light seemed like a searchlight shining around, but it stopped when it landed on the X. The carcasses around the ground started quivering like they were vibrating. And out of each one rose a pale, wispy form, and they all got drawn up into the light towards the aircraft. I don't know what to call it, but an aircraft. It was triangular in shape. After that, the carcasses became still again, and the blue light disappeared. The whole time, everything had been completely silent. As soon as it was gone, I hightailed it out of there as best as I could, and all the crazy wildlife reappeared. I really wanted to know if anyone else has reported something like that. I still can't wrap my mind around it. And apparently, in those days at least, MapQuest always gave you the shortest route possible as the crow flies. I never follow directions like that anymore. We hear a lot of stories up in these woods, and I never believed them until this past year. See, I live up in Baudette, Minnesota. It's up on the Canadian border near the Lake of the Woods. There's Pine Island State Forest just south of town and Rainy River to the north. That's also the Canadian border. Because of the river, it's the walleye capital of the world, home of Willie the Walleye. The point is, there's not much up here except the town. I mean, you go south into Minnesota and there's nothing until Red Lake. It's woods mostly. In winter, it's cold, like to the point where you have to plug in your car at night if you want to start it in the morning. I travel a lot by snowmobile in the winter. It's just easier. Baudette's got about a thousand people, which is about a thousand people too many for me. So I got me a house on the edge of town. My buddy Derek, he lives even further out, not even in the city limits. People say Derek's crazy, but me, I just think he sees things other people don't see, you know? He pays attention. He doesn't have a smartphone or anything like that. He watches things in the woods. One day last winter, I went out to see him because my grandma said my deer meat was taking up too much room in her freezer. I figured I'd bring some to him and we'd have a couple drinks and hang out for a while. So I took the snowmobile because I can take a shortcut through the woods that way. And I don't have to worry about whether or not the county plowed Derrick Street. I set out later than I meant to because of course grandma wanted me to shovel the walk first. It was December and it gets dark around 4 o'clock. When I finally got all the meat loaded on the snowmobile, the trees were already making long shadows on the snow. I almost didn't go. But if I tried to go the next day, she'd do the same thing. I got on the snowmobile and put my helmet on and hit the path through the woods. The light lit up the trail pretty good, but I still took it slow. You never know when a deer might run out in front of you and that could be the end of you. So as I'm going, I'm just watching the trees go by when something did jump out on the trail, but jump isn't the right word. That thing strolled. It was a good 20 or 30 feet in front of me but my snowmobile light lit it up real good. Still, I couldn't believe what I saw. 
It must have been nine feet tall. I mean, I could see it was tall as one of those pine trees. At first, I thought it must be some kid messing around with me because nothing has antlers and stands on two feet. But this was no kid with a costume. It had a skull for a face. I got one look into those empty eye sockets, and I almost fell off my snowmobile. I never remember being that scared. But just when I was trying to decide if I should turn around or not, it disappeared. It didn't walk away, it was just gone. So of course, I wondered if it was ever there at all. Maybe I just imagined it. I thought I saw it, but once it was gone, I had my doubts. I told myself it was a weird hallucination and just kept going. But when I got to the spot where it was, it smelled like something rotten. Like when hamburger meat goes bad in the fridge except worse. Much worse. It only lasted for a second though. So I just told myself I was imagining things again. I blew past that spot and kept going to Derek's house. Like I said, his house is basically in the woods. He's got a dish on the side for TV and a bunch of wood piled up on the side for his fireplace. That's the only heat he's got. I just leave my jacket on when I go inside. Once I went in, we had a few drinks and I started explaining what I experienced. He told me that's a Wendigo. Now I've heard a few stories about this thing, but I don't know what to believe so I asked him. He said that all he knew was it was wandering around the woods and it was quiet as death. He'd seen it out of his window a few times, but it never came close to the house because he made a circle of salt around it. Salt keeps all kinds of evil away, he said. So he said he figured it was worth a try. I ended up spending the night at Derek's house and left in the morning to go home. I didn't see anything on the way home, though I did smell that rotten meat when I passed through that spot. I tell you what, when I got home, I got out that rock salt I use on the sidewalk, and I made a circle all the way around the house. Now I've never seen that outside of my house, and I've been back to Derek several times, but I've never seen it again. I don't trust people that don't believe in the paranormal. How can you say spirits don't exist? It makes no sense to me. How can you be sure something you can't see isn't there? People will just say aliens don't exist. The earth is one tiny speck in an infinitely expanding universe. What kind of person is 100% sure that there isn't life anywhere else but on earth? That blows my mind. Anyways, I know you read paranormal experiences on your channel, so I'll tell you about something that had happened to me back when I was a park ranger. We had gotten all kinds of reports from campers and hikers of screams in this one section of the forest. People hear crazy things in the forest all the time. But we received over 40 accounts of hearing screams near this campsite. My partner and I grabbed our gear and got in the truck and headed down the road. We decided to camp out there for the night so we wouldn't miss anything. We started a fire and set up a couple of tents and brought some food. We were in pretty good shape. Even if we didn't get to the source of the notorious screaming, we were prepared to have a good night out camping. We grilled some steaks and sat around for a while enjoying the peace. Then we hear this terrible scream coming from deep in the forest. We radioed in that we heard a scream and we were going in the woods to investigate. We grabbed our flashlights and started making our way towards the scream. There wasn't much noise after that. We just took our time and slowly made our way deeper into the woods. The forest was weirdly quiet, and it felt like something was wrong. We both stopped walking and just stood in the middle of the forest to see if we could hear anything. Suddenly, we heard a scream so loud that it hurt both of our ears. It wasn't like anything that we've heard before. It was human-like, but much more bellowing and with more of a growl to it. I looked to my left and I saw the most terrifying creature I've ever seen in my life. It was freakishly tall, standing on its hind legs about seven feet tall. It had these glowing yellow eyes and it looked like a wolf, but much larger and much more muscular. Its face was menacing, like a cross between a wolf and an ape and a demon. It charged right at me. I dove out of the way to avoid being trampled to death. I heard gunshots and when I looked, I saw my partner fire several rounds into the creature. It swung at my partner and he jumped out of the way, inches from being butchered. I shot it in the back of the shoulder 
and it whipped around and looked at me right in the eyes and howled at me. I ran away as fast as I could towards the campsite and heard my partner screaming behind me. I couldn't just leave him back there to get mauled, so I went back towards him. When I met back up with him, he was halfway up a tree and pointed in the direction the creature ran off. We both started running out of the forest when we heard it scream again. It was very much still alive. We gathered up everything from the campsite, shoved it in the van, and got the hell out of there. When we were filing the report, we got a visit from a man in a suit from the U.S. Department of the Interior. When we told him what had happened, he repeated the story back to us, but insisted we report it as a rabid bear. We explained to him that it wasn't a bear. Its eyes glowed yellow, and it looked like a wolf ate mix. We told him it was over seven feet tall and it screamed like a human. He simply nodded and then after a pause, he insisted again that the encounter we had was a rabid bear. He also congratulated us on successfully killing the creature. I explained to him that we didn't kill it and it was still running wild in the forest. Then he got very stern with me and said, if I valued my job, my freedom and my life, I will put that we killed a rabid bear causing all the issues. It was a disturbing moment. He ripped up the initial report and said that he looked forward to reading about what had happened to us in the forest. Then he left. I was terrified and pissed off. There was something seriously dangerous in our backyard and the government wouldn't let us get the help that we need to get rid of it. It made me question all the information I've ever received in my entire life. I lied on the report and so did my partner under the threat of losing my job, being thrown in jail, or even killed. We were forced to lie about the most traumatic moment of our lives. I quit shortly afterwards. I won't go near a government job again. If that happened to me, how many other people was this happening to? Hey Donovan, love your channel man. Some of the things people experience blow my mind. I'm grateful for you providing a place where people can share their stories without fear of ridicule and with a sense of camaraderie. I've been a police officer for about three years, and already I could write a book on some of the experiences I've had. I have to tell you about this crazy call I responded to that I could only describe as paranormal. I got a call about a man who claimed that someone was breaking into his house, so I turned around and headed to his address. He lived in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by woods for miles. If someone was breaking into this guy's house, it was someone who knew him well. I got out of the car and I started looking around. The windows of the house were broken and the door was busted in. I pulled out my gun and I yelled, police, come out with your hands up. Thank God, thank God, a man screamed. It almost got me. This was clearly the owner of the house an elderly gentleman who was shaking in fear. I asked him if there was anyone else in the house and he told me that he was alone. I asked if the burglars were still around and he said, it was no burglar. The demon, it almost got me. I told him to wait in a patrol car where it was safe. I started looking around the house. I checked every room in the house and didn't see any signs of anyone still there. I circled outside the house and looked all around. All of the doors and windows were bashed in, but I didn't see any evidence of a criminal still being around. I asked the old man to get out of the patrol car and we sat down outside. I told him to take deep breaths and calm himself down. I told him the calmer and clearer he was, the better I could help him find whatever is responsible. The man laughed at me and said, it was no criminal. The demon will keep trying, but he will never take me alive. I asked him what he meant and he said that a demon lived in the woods behind his house. He would see him poke out his head from the trees from time to time and disappear back into the woods. Then the demon got braver and would look through the windows until the old man saw him, and he'd run back off into the woods. He only recently started trying to attack the old man, and this time was the closest that he got. The old man described the demon as having pale white skin with large black eyes and a very large mouth. He said it was skinny and tall, and it ran on all four legs like a dog. I didn't know how to take this. The man was pretty old, 
and I doubted he had the capability to bash in the windows and the doors himself. He didn't seem crazy, but the demon he was describing couldn't possibly be true, could it? The way I saw it, someone tried to hurt the old man, and maybe it was dark, so he thought he saw a demon. When someone is under that kind of stress, they often recall details inaccurately, and that could be the case here. It could also be somebody wearing some sort of mask to disguise their identity. Either way, I didn't feel good about leaving that elderly man alone to be attacked again. I asked him if there was some place else that he could stay, and he refused to leave. I'm going to be the one that shoots this demon, the man said. I want to be there when the life leaves his eyes. My face will be the last thing he'll ever see. I didn't want to leave the man, but I got another call that I had to respond to. I checked up on that man about a week later, and he had his windows and doors replaced, and seemed to be in a pretty good headspace. One night, I responded to a call about someone trying to break into a house. When I looked at the address, it was the same as the old man's. I turned on my lights and sirens and sped there as quickly as I could. I arrived on the scene and the windows were bashed in again and the door was kicked in. I pulled out my gun and shouted, please come out with your hands up. There was no response. I called for the old man several times and got no response. I walked into the house and started looking around. The door to the bedroom was kicked in and a trail of blood went from the bedroom out to the back door. I followed the trail and it was clear that a body was dragged out into the woods. I called for backup right away. I was not about to head into the woods with a murderer by myself. The backup arrived and we searched all night but couldn't find the old man anywhere. The next morning we found him several miles into the woods with huge bite marks all over his body. Someone or something feasted on that old man. The officers talk about the cannibal in the woods but I was starting to believe this old man's story. This thing attacked this poor man several times and ate him. I'm not saying that humans aren't capable of cannibalism. After everything I've seen, I can tell you that humans are capable of unspeakable things. But the old man described this creature vividly and saw him on multiple occasions. I feel responsible for his death and I can't let it go. I can't imagine him going out that way, being eaten to death. Nobody deserves that, especially not that old man. Thanks for letting me get this story out there. I was working in an animal testing laboratory. I'm not proud of this, but I was young and I needed the money. It paid well and offered me an opportunity to get experience in the scientific field, which proved to be very valuable. Large corporations, all of which the average person would recognize, paid an unbelievable amount of money to have their products tested on different animals. A lot of them would openly request human testing, but we didn't do any human trials, at least none that I was directly involved with. One day, my team was put in charge of this fast healing antibiotic ointment. Our job was to test it on a variety of animals and to see how they healed. We started trials with mice. We made very small puncture wounds on 5,000 lab mice that were split into two groups. We would monitor how the mice would heal naturally, and then we would treat the other mice with the antibiotic ointment. The mice who received no treatment healed almost completely after seven days. The mice who received the ointment had no evidence of any wounds after two days. To put this into perspective, the ointment that the average person has in their medicine cabinet has almost no data backing up claims that it heals wounds faster. This ointment defied what we thought was possible. We continued the trials on several different animals, and they all experienced the same thing. Every creature reacted positively to the ointment that it was unbelievable. There wasn't a single case of side effects from the ointment, and every animal completely recovered and didn't leave a trace of ever being wounded. I was incredibly excited, as this was by far the most positive trial I've ever been a part of. I saw some horrific things in the lab, and as an animal lover, it weighed heavy on my heart to see animals react negatively and even die during trials. But for a moment, testing out this ointment made me feel like I was truly making the world a better place. Then something strange happened. Orders were flying around the laboratory about performing immediate orders were flying around the laboratory about performing immediate human trials. 
It was suggested to pay willing volunteers to test out the ointment, but it was met with resistance. And I was told to just keep testing on animals until they came up with a solution. Shortly after that, we started receiving these giant metal crates that were completely enclosed with electrical generators on the outside of them. It was bad enough to voluntarily be involved with animal testing, but I couldn't be a part of any involuntary secret human testing. I watched as those crates were unloaded. Were there really humans in there? I racked my brain trying to figure out where they're getting these living human beings from. It was too much. I started losing sleep. I had to figure out what was in those crates. On my day off, I came in pretending to have forgotten something in the lab. I snuck off towards the new section of the facility where they were keeping these crates. I slowly made my way over and heard some guys talking inside. I looked inside and saw two men sitting at the bottom of a hospital bed, and in the bed looked like this demonic humanoid lizard creature. It had scales for skin, these big yellow lizard eyes, and huge ears. It was just lying there with its hands crossed on its chest. One worker was talking about his stable condition and lack of side effects, while the other was writing notes on a clipboard. I was seriously freaked out and got the hell out of there. The next day, I quit, and when my boss asked why, I said that I needed to take care of my parents. He stared me down and I couldn't tell if he believed me or not. Okay, he said, and I got the hell out of there. I can only imagine what the job would entail now had I stayed. One thing is for sure, I never want to see a creature like that again. I wish I never saw it honestly. Hi Donovan, love your show and what you're doing with getting the word out there. I know there are a lot of naysayers out there who don't believe in the paranormal, or who think these creatures don't exist, or events don't take place but I'm here to tell you, they absolutely do without a doubt. Listening to all the stories that are sent in makes me feel better about what I experienced. I can't go into great details on where I worked or who I work for, but this happened in the late 90s. I held an office job for a scientific company. There were six of us who worked in the safety processing department. We would process paperwork and approvals for chemicals and materials that were involved in various experiments. The company had several large government contracts, which was a major part of the business. It was in a very secure location. We all had badges and the entire facility had tall barbed wire fencing with gates manned by security guards that you had to pass through upon entering. It was a hassle to go out for lunch, so most of us would just eat in our little lunchroom. I worked with five other people, three women and two men. We all had similar responsibilities, but I was the manager of that department. Even as the manager, they never gave too much information away on what was going on there. We were fairly close to the testing facility. Outside of our office was this long corridor, and at the end was the entrance to the testing facility. None of us were ever authorized to go in there. It's manned by guards 24-7, even if there's no testing going on. Now some of us would go out to happy hour after work, but the guards never came, even after multiple invites. They never associated with us at all. Looking back, they were most likely instructed not to interact with any of the regular employees. The only people who had access to that area were high level executives, scientists, and the like. So one day while we're working, I hear the breach siren go off. This was the first time that I heard this other than a precautionary drill. Now we ran these drills every six months. They were always scheduled and people knew about them weeks in advance. We had to make sure we were complying with safety regulations. And as a department manager, I would have known because I have to keep a head count of everybody in my department. This one was the real thing. If something happens in that testing facility and a chemical or a gas is leaked, the siren goes off. Really, any breach of the testing facility that is not planned, the breach sirens go off. As soon as we hear the sirens, a coworker of mine, I'll call her Jenny, comes running into the door from the corridor side of the office, screaming and completely out of breath. We all huddled around her and asked her what is going on. Now keep in mind the siren is still blaring at this point, so we need to evacuate immediately but we pause for a second to see what Jenny is so frightened about. 
She's talking gibberish and is pointing to the corridor. So I look at the security monitor in the corner of our office, which is a live view right outside of our door into the corridor. I see this creature walking down the hallway, and I see both guards lying on the ground. At the time, it was too hard to make out if the guards were dead or not, but I assumed they were. This humanoid creature is walking very oddly coming down the corridor right towards us. The thing looked demonic, like something straight out of hell. I can't even describe what animal it resembled because this thing didn't have a face. It looked like it just had this huge mouth and that was it. Had these really long fingers and toes. They looked very odd. From the look I got of this thing, it looked like more than five fingers. It stood probably seven feet tall and had these bony legs but broad shoulders and its arms were abnormally long. I immediately locked the door and told everyone to evacuate right now. I counted six of us including me at the time and we went to the opposite side from the corridor to our exit point as fast as we could. There were a bunch of employees outside at that moment because the siren went off for the entire building. Everyone was asking what had happened, but my office area was the only one close to the corridor. My boss immediately came over to me and my group and pulled us aside. We met with him and his boss, the director of testing, and they instructed us not to say anything to the other employees. And if we said something, we could be terminated or held liable for leaking company information. That day, we were all told to go home and the facility was shut down for three days. They blamed it on a gas leak out of the testing facility, but I know what really happened. They created something, or were doing tests on something that already existed. I quit a few months after the incident, and a lot of my team eventually quit too. That place was eventually shut down in 2010. Like I said, I can't give all the details, but thanks for reading my story. Hey Donovan. I can't say I'm happy to be writing to you, but I sure do have a story to tell. I want to be clear and let you know that this sounds wild, but it's the truth and if you don't want to believe me that's fine, but I've got the scars to prove it. I'm a lobster man by trade. I work in Cape Cod, Massachusetts and earn a pretty decent wage. If you don't mind smelling like the sea, it's not so bad. Last year my friend and I went in on a new boat together. We were running along as freelancers for a while, but we decided it's about time we become our own bosses and set sail under our own conditions. The first issue with being the captain is finding a crew. Although we have tons of friends in the industry, it's risky to join with the new captain and there are union benefits in place to prevent movement to a new boat. A few decided to jump ship and come with me, but not enough to run smoothly. So I was the captain without a full crew. For the most part, boats these days can steer themselves, but the boys are needed for maintenance and upkeep on board and for safety. I don't know what compelled me that day to do it, but I went out alone. It was clear skies and smooth sails, so I never thought I'd have a problem. I was about a mile out to sea when I saw the first clouds roll in. They were thick and heavy, and right away I knew I was done for. The rain and wind came on fast, and before I knew it, I was fighting against the elements. It was rough and I was scared half to death. Little did I know this would be the worst thing to happen to me that day. I was pushed to an inlet. The waves were huge and spilling up onto my deck. I spotted an old harbor, one that had been abandoned some time ago for a newer set of docks, about a half mile northward. In my mind, an abandoned harbor means empty docks and a clear spot for landing to sit out the storm. I fought against the waves and the wind and steered over and did my best to drop anchor. I figured if I could just wait out the storm, I'd be okay. Through the rain and the fog though, I saw something approaching. It was walking up on the dock on all fours. At first, I thought it was a wolf or a coyote or something, but those things really aren't spotted out here on the Cape. Then I think to myself, maybe it's a big dog, like a pit bull or something. And man, those guys can be mean, but at least you know what you're dealing with. But then it stood up, like on its two feet, up in the air. And it was tall, and I mean really tall. Its face looked like a German Shepherd or something, with these gobs of drool coming down its chin. 
It was staring right at me. Well, all this time that it's just walking up the dock, I'm just staring over at it and can't move. It's like I'm paralyzed or something. And it's only when it's like 10 feet away do I realize it's coming right for me now. It was still pouring and foggy and the waves were huge. But I decided I'd rather face the elements than face this creature. So I started to untie the knots and roll up the anchor. The waves had been pushing me so close to the dock that I actually had to fasten myself right on to keep from hitting it. I needed to lean over the edge to get the boat untied. I tried to do it as quickly as possible, but the rain made the knot slip and tighten, and being near to that thing was making my hand shaky. I just about had the knot loose when I felt this sharp pain in my arm. That dog thing had scratched my arm. I screamed out in pain, but I knew no one would hear me. I pulled my arm away and jumped back. I fell onto the boat, but I had the rope in my hand. The knot had come undone. This thing was perched on the edge of the boat as it started to be set free from the dock. A huge wave splashed over the deck, and the entire boat rocked back and forth. This thing looked around at the waves and then back at me, and then jumped off the boat back onto the dock. I don't want to say I'm lucky because I sailed back to shore to the emergency room and had to get nine staples in my arm. But I'm lucky that I'm alive. The scar at left takes up half of my forearm. Now I've never seen this creature again, but I can tell you every time I dock, I'm always paranoid and looking around. I live in Prescott Valley, Arizona. It's a pretty decent part of the country, without all that glitter and splash you see in the city. This was a Sunday afternoon and I was driving along Iron Springs Road, a section out by Granite Mountain Wilderness Area. It's a good drive to clear your head. You can see for miles, and sometimes you can spot pronghorn herds in the distance. I was heading back home, so it was late in the afternoon, probably around 5.30 when I saw it. There was this flash in the sky ahead like an explosion, and I could see something falling down fast. My first thought was it was a small plane that had run into trouble. I checked my phone first to call 911, but no signal. I drive a Nissan Pathfinder, so no worries going off-road, and I figured somebody might need help fast. I tried to pinpoint a place where I'd seen it go down, and got ready for a bumpy ride. In about five minutes, I came upon the scene of the accident. I couldn't drive all the way up, since the wreckage was up on top of a rocky knoll, but I hopped out of my truck and jogged up there. I couldn't believe my eyes when I cleared the last boulder. There was some kind of weird small craft, unlike anything I'd ever seen. It was angular and pointy, and made of some sort of shimmery silver-green material. I can't tell you what shape it originally had, because the thing was broken in half, all twisted up and smoking. I was just fixated on the weird metal, or whatever it was, trying to figure out what the heck I was seeing. So I'm standing there about 15 feet away from the thing, when something moves. A creature, notice I don't say person, came out from where it must have been standing behind the wreckage. It was small, probably no bigger than five feet tall, but it still scared me speechless. It wasn't human. It looked like the iconic alien pictures you see. Thin body, skinny arms, legs, big oval shaped head, big black bug eyes. It focused on me and I was terrified. Even though I got the feeling it was injured, there were no cuts or anything that I could see. No green blood oozing or anything like that. It was just a feeling I had, I can't explain it. Like I knew it was hurt, and I knew it was sad. I think another one of its kind didn't survive the crash. All at once I kind of knew these things, no explanation. I was too freaked out to even care if it needed help. I just wanted to be away from there as fast as I could. But then something strange happened. It was just fixing me with this look, and suddenly I was stepping towards it, not away. It was like my feet had a mind of their own. I'm ashamed to say, but I remember hearing myself whimpering like a dog. I was so scared and so powerless. It was the most frightening thing that I'd ever experienced. I felt like it was somehow dragging me forward, but then all of a sudden I heard this noise, and the dragging forward feeling stopped all at once. I still couldn't move, but at least I wasn't being forced to come closer. It was a loud ringing sound, 
like the sound waves after you hit a thin piece of metal, but way louder. And the air seemed to be pressing in on my head. It seriously felt like that, like I was getting squished on all sides by the air itself. A bright light came shooting in from the east. I know that because the sun was setting behind me in the west. The light was a bluish color and really bright, and suddenly this thing appeared overhead. A ship, I guess. I mean, it was bigger than a house and I couldn't see the whole thing. It appeared all at once, suddenly just there looming over us. I hunched down, covering my head when a beam shot out of the bottom, shining on the wreckage. I heard this terrible, loud, screeching noise. All at once, I realized I could move, and I ran like hell, feeling like something terrible was coming. I booked it, stumbling over rocks and praying I didn't fall. I just had this awful feeling of foreboding. I knew I had to get away. I got to my pathfinder and hopped in and took off. I was too scared to do anything but just drive for a minute or two. When I finally looked in the rearview mirror, I could still see that beam of light, as bright as a lightning bolt. I drove straight to the Prescott Police Department, which was about 25 minutes away. Within five minutes, I was regretting my decision. They didn't take me seriously, asked if I had been drinking, acting like the whole thing was some joke. After a few minutes of feeling foolish, I went home. I don't know what happened to that crash site. I monitored the news for the next few days and there was nothing. Honestly, I wouldn't even believe this if a friend told it to me, but it actually happened to me.